morning, everybody. Yeah, and I want to talk about happy mind, happy life. You want to have a happy life, you must first establish a happy mind. You know, I'm a psychologist, so I talk a lot about the brain and the mind because this is what I studied. And um, my text will be taken from 3 John verse 2. John said, Beloved, I pray, I pray that you may prosper in all things. I think this is what I want. I, I hope that this is what you want too, that you will prosper in all things. How many of us want to prosper in all things? You know, your pursuits, your relationship, your marriage, your family, we will prosper in all things. So nothing wrong with uh, being prosperous, okay? And you will first be prosper in, you will prosper in all things and be also, and also be in health. Yeah, no point having all the material things of the world, but we don't have a good health to enjoy it. Right? We must have a balanced lifestyle. We have, uh, maybe God will bless us with material things of the world, that's fine. But we also need to be prospering in our physical health. And more importantly, John said, our soul needs prospering too. And this is one area in our life that we tend to ignore. Right? There are three things that we need to prosper. Number one, all things. Number two, in health, just as your soul prosper. So we can have all the assets, all the material things of the world. We may be healthy in our lives, but our mind is not healthy. We won't enjoy our material things. We won't enjoy our healthy body. We won't enjoy our relationships and our family. Here, we have to prosper. And the word soul that John used was this word shuki in Greek. And that means psyche. And that's where we have the English word psychology from, the psyche. That your mind, your mind must prosper. That's your soul, he said. Your soul, your soul is your mind. That's your psyche. And that when your mind and your soul prosper, you will enjoy what you have. You enjoy your health. You enjoy everybody that, that God has put in uh, connection with you. Your soul must prosper. And when your soul prosper, all things will prosper. Your physical health will prosper. Sometimes our physical health suffer because our soul is suffering. And in the medical world, we call that psychosomatic problem. When your soul is the cause of your physical health. So your soul must prosper. And this is what Galatians chapter 5 tells us. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That's what it is all about as Christians. Christ has set all of us free. So we need to stand firm. And do not let ourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. So maybe we have a difficult past. But when we come to Jesus, when we get to know Jesus as our Lord and Savior, you know what? He set us free from the past. So we don't have to go back to the past. God has set us free so that we can have a good future. It's about tomorrow. Tomorrow will be better because today I am set free. But tomorrow is not better when my mind is still stuck in our past. You know, there's a Mandarin phrase that said, Ming tian hui ken hao. Tomorrow will be better. But tomorrow will only be better if you make the right decision today. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. You notice that the cage door, the cage door of this, uh, uh, this the cage door is open. But there is a cage bird that remains inside. Maybe it speaks, but some of us, that God has set us free from our past, from our mistakes, from our failings. But we are so afraid of taking risks again, and so we stay in the cage, in spite of the fact that the cage door is open. It's your mind. It's in your mind. The reason why I live in the States right now is because I joined. I was actually headhunted by this organization called People for Care and Learning, 
Well, our main focus, our main trust of this organization is to break cycles of poverty around the world. And the headquarter is in Mobile, Alabama. And at the time when I was asked to go to Mobile, Alabama, both my children were studying in the States. Right? My daughter was studying in Tennessee. My son was studying at, uh, in Buffalo, New York. I thought, hey, wow, God has opened the door for me to, go to come to the States so that I, be, I, I can be closer to my children. Right? Wow, it's like, yes. So I said yes to them, and we moved to Mobile, Alabama. A year later, both my children graduated, and they flew back to Singapore, leaving my wife and I stuck in the U.S. Right, this was the reason why we are staying in, uh, well, we are living in Mobile, Alabama now. See, our main focus, like I said, was to break cycles of poverty. And so about 15 years ago, we worked with the government of uh, Cambodia. The people in Cambodia, were, you know, they had this abject poverty and they were living in conditions such as this. Waterborne disease is the number one killer, not influenza, not nothing. Because you look at, you know, the water, you know, they take this water from the drain from the floor to cook, to drink and all that. And so this was their con condition. And so we partner with the government of uh, Phnom Penh in, in Cambodia and said, you give us a big pass of land, we will build 500 homes for you and for these displaced families. And because they were living in such a condition, and we thought, hey, let's build them homes. We promised to build 500 homes. So I raised funds, about 4 million US dollars, to build 500 homes, you know. It's, it's not very expensive, right? $4 million for 500 homes. So we basically built houses like this, 20 by 45, 50 feet. Uh, but they have concrete walls. They have roof over their head. They have pipe water running into their homes. And we built all this for them. And, um, and we also had a me medical clinic, a medical center in that we call this city in that city so that whoever is sick, they can go to this medical clinic. And so we provided all this for them. And um, for two years later, the whole project was completed. We hand the keys to the folks that were supposed to receive these homes. The government had already um, assigned homes for these people, for each family. And they were very happy to receive the key to their new homes. But what happened next shook us because after they received the keys, they put their houses for sale. For $4,000, they sold the house and then they go back to live in the slum. You see, we can give them all kinds of stuff, homes, houses, pipe water, but if their mind doesn't change, they'll go back to where they were. You know, uh, on Thursday, we arrived, my wife and I walk along the street, and we walk to Chinatown, and then to Gaston. Between Chinatown and Gaston, we, we walk in the street where the homeless are. They were, they were putting needles in, in their body. You see, the government here are so generous. They can help them. But if these people, people's minds don't change, they will always go back to their lifestyle. You can give them food, you can give them shelter, you can give them whatever they need. But if their mind don't change, they will go back there. And that's why Paul says, uh, John says, may, uh, you know, may you prosper in all things, may you prosper in your health, but just as your soul prosper. When you don't prosper in here, you go back to your old. You're not being set free, even though we may have said yes to Jesus. He says, just as your soul, and the word soul is the word psyche that we understand today. Your mind, your heart and your mind. Just as your soul prosper. You know, if you feel, if you want to change and be transformed in your life, this is what the Bible says in Romans chapter 12 verse 2. Right? Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. We can only be transformed into a new creature, into a new person by the renewal of our mind. It's not buying a new car, getting a new house. Those, are, those things are good. But we, if we want to live a transformative life, we need to renew our mind. 
It is by the renewing of our mind that we find changes in our lives. You know, in this world today, we are often comparing ourselves with others. And we feel less. We feel inadequate. Right? We, we stalk others on their Facebook and on their social media. Wow, so and so uh, can go to Italy for holiday. Uh, and me, I'm stuck here. And so when you compare yourself with others, you feel less. You feel inadequate. Now, anytime you feel less, put a letter in front of the word less. It changes the word. That letter is B. You can be blessed. Just put a letter B right in front of the word less. And that's where you can be blessed. And there's another word that starts with the letter B, and that's belief. You got to believe that God can bless, God can change, God can heal, God can transform, God can repair and restore our relationship. You got to believe that. In fact, the word believe is a verb, an active verb. It is not a noun, it is not a passive word. If you say you believe, then you got to believe, you got to do it. It's an active word, word uh, verb. When I say I believe in Christ to change me, change my lifestyle, and then bless me in all my pursuits of life, you know what? I need to get up of my seat and start believing that God is going to open doors for me. It's, it's an active verb. We cannot sit and do nothing and say we believe if we yearn for something in, in our lives. This woman, was, there was a woman that was, they had this issue of blood for 12 long years. No doctors can heal her. And in the old Moses law, you know, if a woman is menstruating, the man, the husband cannot touch her. No man can touch her because they believe that, oh, this is the uh, period that, that, that they are menstruating and, and, and if we touch that woman who is menstruating, then we'll, we will be soy. That, that's the old law of mosaic. That we know it doesn't, is not uh, true. And so it seems that the story in the Bible that describes her is that she was alone. Maybe her husband abandoned her because she cannot be touched for 12 long years. And whatever that she had, whatever money that she had, whatever valuables that she had. She, she paid all these physicians and the, lawyer and the doctors to heal her, but none can do so. Then one day, she saw Jesus walking with a group of men, maybe about a hundred of people were surrounding Jesus and they were walking with, uh, to Jairus' house to heal her daughter. And then this woman then saw Jesus walking by and she said, maybe, Maybe this man can heal me. And she took the risk. Because remember, if she knew she was bleeding and she would touch a man, she can be stoned to death. So she took the risk because there are so many people crowding around Jesus and, and, and you know, the street of um, Jerusalem is not paved with what you have, we have here today. It's all dust. And so when all the men were walking, they stir up a cloud of dust. And so what she did was she go underneath the cloud, among the feet of men, and then she went and touched the helm of Jesus. And she was healed. Just taking steps, believing that this man can heal me, this Jesus has done it before, he had healed others, he can heal me. And she took the risk. It's like, you know, maybe she was stepped upon by men or whatever because there was a crowd that was surrounding Jesus. And then she touched the helm of Jesus and then she was healed. That's belief. That's belief. It, it is doing something about your belief. Walter Winter wrote this, and he said, if you think you are beaten, 
you are. If you think you dare not, you don't. If you like to win, but you think you can't, it's almost certain you won't. If you think you will lose, you are already, already lost. For out of the world we find success begins with a fellow's will because it's all in the state of mind. You know, the whole battle, spiritual warfare, is in here. It's in here. The enemy will whisper into your ears and call you by your pain. You are stupid, you are a fool, you are useless, you are a failure. And he will whisper all this into our ears so that we will then fuse with our pain. And we, when, when we interact with others, we interact as though we are a failure, I'm a failure, I'm, a, I'm stupid, I'm ugly. And we become the pain. Very often, my, my patient would come into our clinic. The moment they sat down, they would look at me and say, Doug, I'm depressed. I say, hey, chutomate, wait, wait, chutomate. Your name, the, the, the name that you fill in in the form when you came in, your name is Tommy. Since when you changed your name to depressed? You see, he has fused himself with the disease. So how can Mr. Disease help his disease? How can Mr. Depressed help his depression? Tommy can fight his depression. But when Tommy is so fused with his pain, he cannot do so. You know, Jesus is here. And when he sees you, he don't call you by your pain. He will call you by your name. Maybe we grew up in an environment. Asian parents tend to be very, mm, uh, have those top-down conversations with us. Maybe we were called stupid, idiot, useless when we were a kid. And so when we grow up, we look ourselves in the mirror, we repeat those statements. Idiot, you stupid, you useless. You know, I, I think every morning when we wake up and we do our grooming and, and we shower, we look ourselves in the mirror. I think we need to greet ourselves. Hello, good morning, handsome. We need to greet ourselves. Hello, good morning, beautiful. We, we need to be positive because this is what God will call you, my beloved, my child. I mean, you are the only person in that bathroom. You are the most beautiful person in the room. For me, in that bathroom, I'm the tallest man in the world. So, quit calling yourself by your pain if you want to be transformed and to be happy. Our brain is a fabulous organ. It's an incredible organ that was designed by God. You know, your brain is soft, like tofu, but it is protected by your most dense bone structure called a scalp. Someone must have designed that. It just couldn't just be like this, you know? Right? The organ is so soft, and then it left there. But God designed the brain to be the most incredible organ in your entire body, but it was protected by the skull, your skull. And there's no hole in your skull, unlike your ribcage. So everything that God has designed and created in us is perfect. It's perfect. You know, 1,000 years after we die, you know, our body will disintegrate except your skull. That's how strong that, that, that bone structure is. It, it was designed to protect the most important organ in your body. When this doesn't work, we become a vegetable. So it needs protection, and God protected it with a skull. And every day, uh, according to the laboratory of uh, neuroimaging, we produce 70,000 thoughts every day. Every 70,000 thoughts. And they are mostly based on the past, and it's automatic. In fact, our thoughts, 90% of our thoughts came from our past. If this is how we 
do our stuff, then today we'll do it, do it again. If we don't like a certain food, certain thing, we will not try something new today. So 90% of our thoughts are based on our past and it becomes automatic. It's automatic. But if our past is fixed, our future is choked. You know, if, you, if we were to visit uh, Chiang Rai in northern Thailand, you will visit the elephant camp. They train baby elephants for their logging. And young baby elephants that were just born were tied to a huge, strong tree. And because the tree is stronger than the baby elephant, uh, the elephant, baby elephant could not escape. And every time he tried to get away from that tree, the noose in the, on his leg got tighter and it hurts its, its leg. So it reached a point where this baby elephant resigned. This is my life. Whenever, there is, whenever my leg is tied to a tree, I cannot escape. Maybe we were told we are not good enough. And so for the rest of our lives, we are like this baby elephant who may have grown into a huge, humongous sized animal, but yet whenever the trainer tie a rope around his leg even to a little pole it will not escape because the mind gets stuck it's, it's, it's fixated inside and it's choked in its future we need to break free from this we need to change our mind and our mindset so that we can change our life so there was a man who was lame for 38 years yeah, and he was laying by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years because there was a myth that, that, that people believe that whenever the pool of Bethesda start to stir up bubbles, the first one to jump into the pool will be healed. Now, he was lame. He could not walk. He couldn't help himself to jump into the pool. So for 38 years, he laid by the side of the pool waiting for someone to help him to get into the pool when the, bubble, when the water stirred up with bubbles. I mean, if I have a migraine headache, when the, bubble, when the water starts to bubble us up, I will be the first one to jump in. Everybody that was around the pool have their own physical ailment and they all want to be healed. But for 38 years, this man who was lame was just laying by the poor side. I mean, after a year, if you know that nobody's going to help you, you got to do something about it. Because he was unlike the woman with the issue of blood. She was actively seeking healing while he, he was passive, waiting for people to help him. You know what Albert Einstein said? He said, insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. So for 38 years, he stood there, or laid there, expecting people to, uh, to help him. It's like, the, what, the, what, the bubble is stirred now, let's, let's carry this man. Before they could help him, someone jumped into the pool. I mean, he should know after 38 years. And some of my patients were depressed for a good number of years. And they stayed there. Remained that state. Refused to change their mind to get better. And Jesus came along and asked him, do you want to get well? Now, notice what Jesus asked him. Jesus did not ask him, do you want to be healed? Jesus asked him, do you want to get well? Now, the word well in um, Greek was the word hygis. It means whole. This is where we have our word, English word hygiene from. Do you want to get well? It's, it's not your physical ailment, your, 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 your physical handicap that you need to get well. It's your mind. Do you want to be do you want to get well? 
It's not, do you want to be healed? Maybe some of us have been praying, God, deliver me from this. But maybe God is asking you, no, 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 no. It's not about this that you are praying. It's about, do you want to get well? Maybe some of us need to learn to forgive. Learn to let go of our past. There was a patient of mine who was struck with stroke. Young man, 30-odd years old. So I was asked to visit him. We prayed for him. And I asked him, is there someone that you need to forgive? I said, if this is something that you want to do, just whatever you in your body, you know, through your fingers or whatever, just give me a signal and I'll pray. And he gave me a signal that, yeah, he need to let go of his past. He need to forgive somebody. We prayed for him. And the recovery of this young man was so amazing. Even the doctors were amazed. See, clench fists shakes no hands. When you clench your fists, your whole body tends up and it clogs the blood flow. Clench fists applaud no one. Clench fists receive no gifts. You need to chill, let go, relax. So Jesus was asking him, this man, simple question that requires a simple answer, a yes or a no answer. Do you want to get well? Yes, no. But Jesus knows this guy because Jesus knows all, all of us and our history and, and, and the makeup of our mindset. And Jesus is not asking him, do you want to be healed? But do you want to get well? Because he must be transformed here. You know, the response of this man to this simple question of Jesus reveal who he was. Do you want to get well? I have no one to help me. Into the pool when the water is stirred. While I'm trying to get in, somebody else goes ahead of me. Duh. After 38 years, he has that victim mindset. The entitlement mindset that people should help me. If we want our life to be blessed, we need to take responsibility for our lives. That's why John said, May you prosper in all things. May you prosper in your health just as your soul prosper. Though he was lame, I think he has a postgraduate degree in blaming others for his problem. His life is all about blaming others. And then Jesus said, enough. Stand up. Stand up. Pick up your mat. Walk. With an exclamation mark. Walk. This was the only guy that Jesus spoke to tell him, move on with your life. Get up. Stand up. Stand up. Pick up your mat. You don't belong here. Move on. Walk. So maybe Jesus is asking the same question. Do you want to get well? Maybe all we need to do is to stand up, be responsible, move on from our past pain. He was unlike this woman who crawled 
to Jesus, I think you need to put that back into the, Your mouse needs to go back to, yeah. This woman crawled to Jesus while the lame man laid by the poolside and was passive. Like I mentioned earlier, I, I serve in the organization called People for Care and Learning. Our main trust was to break cycles of poverty. And we learned from that project that I mentioned earlier that, hey, we can build houses for them, but if we don't change their mindset, they will go back to the slum. And so we began to, to understand the concept, and we have education program for the poor and for children to get out, to break out of the mindset of poverty. 25 years ago, when I first visited Cambodia, uh, the children, the orphans, were living on the dump site. Their parents may have passed on because of the civil war, or many of the parents uh, could not afford to raise their children, so they abandoned the children in this dump site. And every child will have a stick, and they'll poke through this rubbish and find food for the day. You know, after visited that site, I mean, I saw these children looking for food among the dump site, among the trash. That's the day I began to say to myself, I will quit complaining my food because my worst food is the best. So these children like this little girl, she would go and pick up trash so that she can sell those plastic bottles for food for the day. No parents, no guidance, no guardians, just surviving on their own. And this little girl had two younger siblings. Her parents had abandoned them, and she became a mother at seven years old. And, brought, and we brought her, them into our homes. And we tried to re-educate their mind. Because the concept of these children, they were called trash kids. For the rest of their life, they will be identified. They will identify themselves with trash kids. I, I was, if they're grown up, I was a trash kid. And so I continue to live this lifestyle. And so we changed the mindset. We give them, we brought them to our homes. We raised them. We give them food. We give them beds. And we give them Jesus. You can be anyone that you want to be. You've got to break out of this, this mindset that you are going to be poor for the rest of your life. You're going to be that trash kid for the rest of your life. And this girl in white, this little girl in white, that was 25 years ago, came into our homes and then we raised her. And we kept prodding and ask her, what do you want to be when you grow up? So resigned. Remember the little elephant that's been tied to the tree? She resigned. I cannot be anybody. I will always, always be like this. No. So we try to coax her and, 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 and encourage her. Then one day she said, I want to be a doctor. Because the people in my village will die because of waterborne disease or flu. There's no medical clinic in the village. I want to be a doctor. I said, good. You know what? You study hard. I'll raise funds for you. I'll get you through medical school. And last year, she became a medical doctor. She broke out of her cycles of poverty in her mindset. Now her Social economic status has risen, obviously, as a medical doctor. And now she's serving in a village. She first, she first has to break that mindset to see changes in her, in her life. Quit calling yourself 
by your pain? Jesus is calling you by your name. He's calling you, my beloved, my child, my precious. The verse that we read earlier, beloved, I pray that you may prosper, number one, all things. That include your family, that include your career, that include your pursuits of life. Number two, prosper in your health. And more importantly, prosper in your soul. And that soul, as you mentioned, is the word psyche here. Your mind. Your mind must change. You change your psyche. You change your life. I once had a patient. She was suicidal. A few nights earlier, she was out in a park with her boyfriend. And they were chatting. And a man came at them brandishing a knife, wanting to rob them. As soon as this young girl, she was about 19 years old, boyfriend about 20 or thereabout, uh, and as soon as this young lady, young teenage girl, saw the man brandishing a dagger at them, she turned hysterical. Don't kill us! Don't kill us! Don't kill us! And her hysterics panicked the robber. And so the robber then attempted to step her in order to silence her. As the robber made the motion of wanting to step her, the boyfriend intervened, and the boyfriend fought with this man with the dagger. And the boyfriend was stabbed about seven times and died on the spot. And she became even more hysterical, obviously so. All of us would be. And help came, she was warded. As soon as she was warded into the hospital, she went to the room, to the bathroom, tried to break the mirror in the bathroom, to take, wanting to take this broken mirror to stab herself. Let me die. Let me die. He died because of me. He died because of me. Let me die. I cannot live like this anymore. Let me die. Obviously, the hospital staff would not. So they have to sedate her, put her to sleep. And then the medical director called me up and said, Fred, would you want to take up this case? I read the brief. And I said, okay. So the next morning at 9, 10 o'clock in the morning, I went into her ward. Her parents were there. Two nurses were in attendance. And I introduced myself. And she looked at me and said, I don't need any help. I don't need any help. If you want to help me, let me die. Because I cannot live like this. I'm so guilty. He died because of me. Would you allow, allow me to die? I said, no. I, all I need is just five minutes of your time. Would you give me five minutes? She refused. She continued to yell and, and ask to die. He died because of me. Don't you understand? And I said, all I need is just five minutes of your time. And the parents came in and intervened and coaxed her and said, hey, why not just give this doctor five minutes? After all these exchanges have gone beyond five minutes, just hear him out five minutes, that's it. And then she slammed by her bedside. She looked down. I take that silence as a consent for me to start my five minutes. And I said, I'm sorry for the death of this brave young man. And she looked, at me, looked up to me and asked, What's your point? What's your point? I said, before I, I, I continue, she said, He died because of me. What's your point? He died because of me. I say, Look, he did not die because of you. And she looked up, looking puzzled. I said, he died for you, not because of you. He fought that man so gallantly because he wanted you 
to live. He died for and not because. Just changing one word, one narrative, one word in the mind changes her outlook. She looked down for a long while and after about 15 minutes of silence, she looked up to me and said, all right, I will leave. His death will not be in vain. I will leave. See, on that day, and about that, this was about 20 years ago, I did not use any strategy taken out of the textbook of uh, psychology or psychiatry. I used the Bible instead. My God died for me so that I can, have life, I can live and live a full life, an abundant life. My God died for me. And you know what? My God died for you too. So if you're struggling in your life, live, fight. God died for you so that you can have an abundant life. You so know, many times when we are struggling, we always look for the cause. That's why we have the word because. We often look for the word cause. We often look for the cause of my pain. I am the one to be blamed for my pain. My parents are the one to be blamed for my life. And so we look for the cause. But Jesus looked at us and said, look for the purpose. So that you can look forward. When Jesus asked a man who was lame, do you want to get well? He was looking for the cause of his pain. Jesus was telling him, stand up, move on, get up, walk forward, move forward. And the word forward starts with the word for. And the word fortune also starts with the word for. The word fortitude also starts with the word for. So whenever we struggle, change our mindset. It's not because of those problems, those people. Maybe it's for a purpose. That I can move forward. Happy mind. Happy life. Three things that John said. We must complete these three things. It's holistic lifestyle, right? May you prosper in all things. May you prosper in your health just as your soul prosper. Shall we pray? Lord, we thank you that you died for us so that we have a life to look forward. Lord, whatever that may have happened in the past, those are things that we can learn from, not a life to live on. We want to look forward. We want to prosper. Prosper in all things. Prosper in our health. Prosper in our mind. Lord, I pray for those who are struggling right now. Whatever that, whatever that may, they may be struggling with, I pray, God, that you'll give them a, a purpose to look forward. I pray, God, that as we walk out of our service today, We will walk out with your presence with us. We will quit calling identi or identifying ourselves with our pain. And we will quit blaming others and circumstances, even ourselves, 
for our pain. But Lord, when we walk out of our service today, we will walk out free. Free. Because the cage, is, cage door is open, we will walk out free. The past is something that we can learn from. Not a place for us to continue to live in. I pray for blessings to come upon everyone here. That you will prosper them in all things, in their pursuits of life, in their marriages, in their family, in their career. Lord, may you prosper them in all these things. Lord, may you prosper them with good health. Lord, may you prosper them in their minds. Help them to cultivate a happy mind so that they can enjoy a happy life. In Jesus' name we all pray. Amen. Pastor. Thank you, Dr. Fred, for a wonderful, awesome message that we can receive for today. And not only for this service, but I just want to um, inform you, update you, that we're going to have Dr. Fred with another session in the SEC, in the carousel, uh, in the afternoon, uh, 2 o'clock. So, so it's going to be about parenting. So you can teach about parenting through the SEC. So feel free if you want to join with us at 2 o'clock today. And also, Dr. Fred have books here. Um, you can have a look and uh, you can get all the books here. There's uh, about life, about brain that you can um, yeah, check it out after this one. Okay. And once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Fred and Sister Agnes for visiting us. I'm looking forward that we can have you next time again okay <laughs> all right so uh, let us stand together and we're gonna close this service let's pray lord jesus we want to thank you for your message i thank you for the word of god that has been shared by dr fred to us we receive this for our soul for our mind and for our spirit and our body let it be uh, a seed that growing in our life that our life may be prosperous. I pray for blessing for Dr. Fred and Sister Agnes and the family and the ministry. And I pray for blessing and protection and favor and use Him more according to Your will and be a blessing for other people more and more, God. And I want to thank You for this moment and this day. So church, let us stretch our hands to God. And I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prosper. So God, bless your people as we're going to dismiss from this place. I believe your mercy, your unfailing love shall follow us all the days of our life. For God, you are good. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name. Everybody say Amen. God bless you. I'll give God praise one more time.